Hi, yes, let's talk about Hyperloop again because it's so much fun. And my video, if you haven't seen it, I'll link it in. This is just another off the cuff um, <laughs> commentary about Hyperloop. It's not a debunking, it's not researched, it's not thorough. It's, that's why it's on the second channel. Um, anyway, this uh, magnetic slug propulsion thing, quite a lot of people pointed out, it's not new um in this cnn article i'll link it in you have to watch the other video for context of this anyway and uh, yeah it's not new once again this is a 19th century thing just like hyperloop is it's actually called the atmospheric railway and i'll link it in you can uh, go have a look at it and it's a it's a thing like well it was a thing and it <laughs> famously um it was a debacle it just yeah it <laughs> failed for so many reasons but hey now we've got these super duper neodymium magnety things that can make it work well apparently um this guy i think he's in california is he 89 year old dude has actually developed um this was from wired um he's developed an atmospheric railway and well here it is let's take a look at it we'll get on to hyperloop later this is just this atmospheric railways concept i.e a magnet in a pressurized some sort of pneumatic pressurized whatever tube pushes along the uh pushes along like a regular train or a carriage along regular tracks or whatever it is it's just an atmospheric railway so let's check it out shall we my name is max schlinger Good on you, Max. And this is the vector system. The vector system. Here it is. Isn't it cute? He built it in his backyard. Big backyard. It's a vineyard. Set along by pressure in a vacuum depends on magnets, a big toy. The vector isn't just a big toy. It's a working concept that depends on magnets. Looks like a big toy. It's pulled along by pressure in a vacuum tube. And there's vowels that pop up and Sounds can sectionize. Like Hyperloop concept? Uh, Hyperloop. Forget it. <laughs> the inspiration no. for this model train is a modern spin on a very old railroad idea. Yep, and they go like, into the idea was very, very similar to what they did in uh, the 1800s. Had they had the magnets that we have today, the high strength magnets probably would have done the same thing we're doing now. Here's how it works the two parts of the train are. The interior part that inside the power tube, this would be the power tube, and exterior. We have a thrust carriage and we have a passenger car. The thrust carriage is coupled to the passenger car via some permanent magnets. Magic! The thrust carriage is inserted within the thrust tube. And so as the thrust carriage moves, so does the passenger carriage. It's possible to move the passenger carriage down the track simply by applying pressure behind or vacuum in front of the thrust carriage like this. Of course, it takes more than a huff and a puff to get a full-size version down the track. You think? This one uses powerful vacuum pumps. This is not a full-size version. We'll get into that. The train could be powered by renewable energy. Using vacuum power instead of an engine keeps the train light enough to tackle hills no normal train could ever ascend. True. Well, the advantage of a system like this is that we can not only cl climb uh, steep grades, uh, we can we could climb grades in excess of 10 10 percent grades. Uh, but we can also go down those grades and we can use what we call uh, atmospheric braking. So a lot of times it's just as important that you can down the grade as up the grade in a safe mode. So if it's such a great idea, why aren't there vector systems whooshing all over the place? Why? Well, I think everyone else is sort of tied into the standard gauge railroad trains that uh, we have today. Even our high speed trains of today are uh, standard. And I think that's sort of a, for a stagnation reason. point in the way people think. Spoken like a true disruptor. <laughs> disruptor. Yeah, okay. Right, the atmospheric railway. Like, it's, this is great. Good on you, Max. Right, what a champion. Built this atmospheric railway in his backyard. Absolutely fantastic. Now, the problem is, 
one of the first things with this atmospheric railway is does it scale? Does it scale to full size? Now, there's some people over on the EEV blog forum who are, which I'll link in down below, who are trying to attempt to do some calculations, you know, how much pressure for a given diameter to move, you know, several hundred tons of carriages and stuff like that. Because, yeah, this one works great in his backyard, which is fantastic because it's a lightweight scale model. It's not carrying people. Even your lightweight rail cars are in the order of 20 plus tons. Okay, this is serious business. And then you've got the regular roll-in resistance, you've got the uh, resistance of the uh, however that piston slug thing is with the magnets on it is transported within that tube, the friction with inside the tube or whatever it is. So I'm having a hard time seeing how this is going to scale up. But hey, I'm not a mechanical engineer. Please get on the EV blog forum, do the calculations and tell us how viable this system is. There's probably a real good reason why nobody's built it. But sorry, Max, it's not because they're, you know, in a stuck in an old way of thinking or something like that. It's because as I showed in this video, um, our current railways are pretty energy efficient per watt hour per, you know, uh, passenger and, and things like that. High speed train, rapid train, commuter rail, they're pretty darn good. So here's the other issue, which is also the killer issue, the number one most important issue for Hyperloop as well as we'll get into in a second. And that is what problem are you actually solving? Is it going to be more energy efficient? Okay, it'd have to be double this. If it's just like a slight improvement up here or something like that, who, who cares, right? They're already quite efficient. You need some other major advantage when you've got all these, you know, pressure valve systems for thousands of kilometers and all, you know, that all have to be sequenced and timed. And however you do this vacuum pressure hydraulic -y system to push this thing along, it's just like extra moving parts and mechanical complexity that can all go wrong and has to be maintained. Trains are pretty simple, you know, electric motors in them you know, overhead uh, wires and just just wheels and very reliable electric motors. It's like, there's not much that can go wrong with them, apart from the Sydney system where the trains are broken down all the time. But anyway, that's beside the point. The new Metro is great. I love the new Metro. And it's driverless too. Oh. And also, how fast is this thing going to run? Because if you can't make it faster than current solutions, what's the point? And that brings us to Hyperloop. Now, you can forget all the hype about Hyperloop and, well, here's the latest CNN article, is it? And the Dubai thing. Oh, Dubai, they're just going to build it. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see what happens at the end of it. Now, here's the thing. When we say Hyperloop, what that means, practically by definition, is that it is ultra high speed, faster than anything we've got available today. And we'll get into that because it's the main point. And also is that it's a low pressure or reduced pressure system. Because a lot of people will talk about, oh, well, they'll just dig tunnels and there'll be just like a maglev inside and a non-pressurized tunnel. Well, in that case, it's not Hyperloop. It's just maglev. <laughs> like, so to be Hyperloop concept, it's got to be the low pressure tube. And of course, well, you know, you can talk about, uh, you know, expansion of uh, pipes. I can put up some uh, numbers for expansion of these uh, steel tubes. No wonder they want to build them underground, make it a bit more thermally stable because all these pipelines, um, yeah, they expand. So they have to put all these, uh, <laughs> these things periodically in them to, that'd be fun, wouldn't it? You go in your hyperloop around there at a thousand kilometers an hour. Woo! Jeez, you can sell tickets for that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> right, it's ridiculous. Expansion of uh, steel right there. Like, anyway, we won't, like, let's not get into that. So the number one thing about Hyperloop is that it has to be faster than current systems. Now, here's a Wikipedia list of high-speed trains. This is just um, like high-speed trains, HSTs or whatever you want to uh, call them, ICEs or whatever, you know. Anyway, at, look at how many of them there are. Let's uh, sort this by operated maximum speed, okay? These are the ones that are currently in operation or will be in operation or were in operation or something like that. Look, 
Uh, how, count how many there are over 300 kilometers now. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20 like well over like 30 trains over 300 kilometers an hour and like a whole bunch at like 250 plus, right? So all these high speed rail networks, there's a ton of them, right? So, and Maglev does 430 and Maglev is an operational commuter system. Okay, it's already running, it already works. So for Hyperloop to even get off the starting blocks, even get off the starting blocks, it's got to be substantially faster, not just 500 k's an hour. If Maglev's already 430, like who cares about Hyperloop at 500 kilometers an hour, right? It's got to be that 600 miles an hour or what's that? Like a thousand odd kilometers an hour. It's got to be approaching a thousand kilometers an hour for this thing to be viable. And it's the same for the atmospheric railway system. What problem is it solving? There's no problem to solve at the moment except speed. And that's it. And that's all you have to worry about and do the calculations for on Hyperloop. Someone on the EV blog Forum, sorry, I forgot who it is, was doing some calculations based on a 200 kilometer an hour Hyperloop. Well, there's no point even doing the calculations for that. I would argue that there's no point even doing the calculations for 500 kilometers an hour because that's not going to do it. And just making it, it maybe nobody's ever given, well, I haven't seen it anyway. Please correct me if I'm wrong down below, but nobody's ever given any real solid evidence and calculations that Hyperloop is going to be more energy efficient as an overall system. Certainly there's no tested system out there that would uh, be more energy efficient. Like, like I said, it's got to be, there's only two things that are going to make Hyperloop viable. One is speed, Two might be, might be energy efficiency. If it's more energy efficient or, or, or three, it could carry more passengers per hour or a combination of all three of those, right? So it's got to have a major advantage like that for it to be a worthwhile endeavor over existing high-speed rail and maglev, right? So there's no point even doing the calculations unless you're talking 800 or 1,000 kilometers an hour. And can it do that sustainably over hundreds of kilometers with like, come on. And Hyperloop is only good for city to city. If you're doing it, you know, stops every 10 kilometers, forget it. It's pointless. <laughs> it's, it's only for city to city infrastructure. So that's it. Um, and really uh, for the complexity of the system, here's where you have to go into the whole complexity of the uh, you know, all the myriad of issues with Hyperloop um, in terms of the mechanical engineering and the design and reliability and the maintainability and everything else and the safety and everything else of Hyperloop. And even if you can solve all of those problems, it's going to be for naught unless it can safely carry passengers, carry the number of passengers required, like, you know, the throughput capacity of people and stuff like that, and be as reliable as existing railways, because if it's not, forget it, it's going to be a non-starter. There are so many issues in here that I, I simply cannot see Hyperloop doing this. It's got, it's a thousand kilometers an hour or bust with the reliability, the safety, the maintainability, the energy efficiency, the cost efficiency, all that, all sorts of things have to go right for this thing to work. I just don't see it. It's not going to happen. Passengers in a reduced pressure tube. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. And some people say, oh, but it won't be a reduced pressure system. It'll have like a ramjet fan on the front and that'll suck all the air in and then push it out the back. Yeah. Okay. Good luck with that one. <clears throat> And then people are talking about all oh, real small diameter ones. You know, they've even shown some, you know, like the current tubes aren't that big. Like, and, and it's like two people side by side lying down like this. And you've just been shot down this tunnel, just like in the running man. That'd be cool, by the way. But, and let's have a look at the Dubai system, shall we? <laughs> look at all this wasted space in here. Look at this wankery. Will you look? I mean, and, and how many people? Two, four, six, eight, like 16 people? Per pod or something like this. Think like, come on, the distances between pods are going to have to be phenomenal. And you want to take like, you know, a, a dozen or two people in the in the pod. No, come on, come on, really? 
once again, to make it viable, it's got to be about throughput. And well, here's the, you know, big hyper fan or whatever it is. And people are lying down there and you know, do it all whooshes around the outside. And ah, she'll be right. And it just levitates. And it could, you only need to push it for the first, you know, a couple hundred meters or first mile or something. And then it glides for a hundred miles. Yeah, sure. Then we can carry a shipping container. Look at this. Oh, what a Bobby Dazzler. Wow, that's a winning idea. Yeah, how long does it take you to get your, uh, to lift the pot out the other end before the next one whizzes through? <laughs> I mean, your average shipping container weighs like two and a half tons or something with a capacity of like 25 tons. Like, yeah, let's shoot that at a thousand kilometers an hour through a low pressure tube. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, yeah, we can go around bends real easy. Yeah, sure. Um, it's, just, it's just no, 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 no. Hyperloop just isn't going to work. Anyway, the takeaway from this video is that the only way Hyperloop is going to be a winner is if it's at least double the speed. And getting these claimed a thousand kilometer an hour speeds. <laughs> that, it's just, oh God, no, just no, no, no. I, and then there's some people who've mentioned that, well, uh, they want to use it on the moon and they want to use it on Mars. That's Elon Musk's dream. You, you know, well, then it's not hyperloop you've already got your reduced pressure then it just becomes a maglev or an existing high speed rail like no <laughs> this is why the hyperloop concept is not going to work hyperloop is a thousand kilometers an hour in a reduced pressure tube let's not say the word vacuum reduced pressure tube it's that or it's bust it, otherwise, it's just a, you know, it's just a maglev or high-speed rail or some, you know, variation of it in a tube. Whoop-de-doo! Catch you next time.